So just really quick, I'll get, I'm going to give you guys a little background on me. Um, a lot of you guys already know me, but I'll give you a little background on me. Um, so I've been, you know, I started coaching in, uh, I don't know, in 2002-ish, somewhere around then. Um, I, um, I've been coaching for a while. More, most recently, I've been coaching at Montgomery Dive Club. Um, a lot of you guys know that as well. Um, I've, I've had a lot of opportunity to coach at a really high level at Worlds and Pan Americas. Um, and I entered into a, a coach mentorship and education program in 2013 through USA Diving and the USOPC um, and got sent to like World Cup right before the 2016 Olympics and sat on the pool deck with the coaches there and met some, some pretty awesome people. And that was part of my mentorship program. And I've done a few trainings at um, US, USOPC. I've done trainings through Pan Americas. I've done uh, dive coach training through FINA, which is the governing body world for diving in the world or, or aquatic sports in the world. Um, so yeah, I've really just, I've, I've gotten a lot of opportunity to do education and, and learn our sport. Um, what I'm gonna show you today, we'll just sort of touch on a little bit of the stuff that I know. But what I, what the main thing that I want you guys to know is that like, I'll be a resource for you guys. If you ever want to reach out or you're having trouble with something like you can always reach out to me. There's lots of really, really talented, good coaches that are in our area that you can reach out to as well. Like it doesn't have to be me, but if you are struggling with anything, I am someone that you guys can feel free to reach out to. Um, also in the chat, David wants you guys to uh, just write your name in there and what club you're with. Um, for multiple reasons, I want to keep track of it, see who see who's participating, um, start building the community. The other thing we're going to say is um, I'm going to ask some questions at the end. If you guys give some answers, we're going to give out some free gear um, that the board, you know, got you guys to do some stuff, some cool stuff with that. Um, I'm trying to think what else there is to say to say about me. My name is Wesley Matice. Says another thing. I don't think I said my name. There may be dogs that that bark every once in a while. Um, yeah, I've coached at all level: high school, summer league, um, USA Diving, AAU, um, junior level, senior level. I've brought kids to um, Grand Prix or you know all that stuff. So, all right. So I made a little. I made a uh, um, PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna share that with you guys. When I share this with you guys, I'm no longer able to see the chat for whatever reason. Um, so just a heads up. So like, I don't mind if you guys take your mic off as long as everybody's not taking their mic off. If you guys take off your mic to say something or turn your mic on, sorry to say something, that's, that's totally fine. Wait, what the heck? I don't know why my presentation is not popping up. Oh, here it is. All right, so hopefully everybody's able to see that and hopefully you're still able to see me as well. Um, this is MCDL Coach Clinic for 2021. Um, I introduced myself and you guys should be introducing yourselves in the chat. If you haven't done so, please do so. Um, the big picture. So um, basically what we do as coaches, this goes beyond being a coach for diving. Um, but, you know, mostly I, we're, we're teaching diving. So number two, um, point number two is just teaching skills. Um, you guys should know what skills that are. And if, and if not, then there are plenty of resources you can go out there and figure out what skills you're supposed to be doing. It. We can get, we're going to go over that a little bit. Um, but you're creating an environment. Hopefully that environment that you're creating is self uh, safe, productive, and empowering, right, to the individuals that you're working with. If you're working with the staff, maybe empowering your staff is part of it as well. Um, so that's a big one. You should be doing no harm, physical or mental, and then coordinating with the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? The stakeholders are probably more people than you think. Obvious, the obvious people are your divers, the people that are that are participating in your team are stakeholders. Their parents are stakeholders. Um, there may be a parent board that is 
working with you as well. And then, uh, you know, stakeholders can even be the lifeguards or swimmers or other members at your club that are invested in, in just the community and the dive program. Um, stakeholders care about what's going on and that's why coordinating with them is important. Who we do it for. Um, so this order isn't necessarily in priority order, but it's pretty dang close. Um, but we do it for the divers. Your, your first contact is gonna be the divers, but your clientele for sure is the parents, right? Those are gonna be the people that you're actually doing the job for. They're gonna be the ones that probably express the most or are most concerned. Um, your work more than likely working for the dive reps, but they're also gonna be your number one support. So if you're having any problems, they'll be able to help you with stuff like that. Um, you're more than likely working for a pool management company if you're working in the MCDL. Um, and then you're also a coach within the league. So knowing you know, all the rules of the league, knowing what, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, you know, uh, I, forget, I forget the word I'm looking for. It will, it will come to me later, but more than just the rules, like who you are as a person, what's the mission of the league and all that stuff, making sure that you're, you're being a part of that is super important. Right. So figuring out what the code of conduct, oh, it's not the word I was looking for, but you know what I mean? Um, parents is a big one. Um, these are your main clients. This is, this is, you know, these, I always called the parents, the clients and the kids, the product that sort of sounds messed up, but that's more or less what, what really is what it is. Um, establishing boundaries early. Basically the reason why you want to do that is because you want to be a professional. Um, this won't always happen, but you don't, you want to make sure you're, you're treating all the, all the parents exactly the same. You don't want to have perceived favoritism. Um, if you're starting to give out information to one more than another, you know, it start, it could spiral um, out of control. So if you, if you keep your boundaries, pretty, uh, I might have to move the dogs. Outside. If you keep your boundaries pretty strong with the parents, um, it allows you to do your job the way that you should be doing it. Um, you know, parent involvement can be really good, but it also can um, sort of inhibit what you're able to do. So just, you know, establishing that early, create a safe space for the kids um managing the numbers that you have making sure everybody knows the rules making sure everybody knows how to follow the rules and listen and what they're supposed to be doing at, at all times is the best way to create a safe space um setting those clear expectations um never lose your temper losing your temper on a kid is the is the best way to make them lose faith in you as a coach and not trust you probably um have a plan when you look like you don't have a plan um you know, it's, it's unorganized. If you have a plan, obviously you're organized. People can follow a plan and you're going to have a lot more success on the pool deck when you have a plan. Um, and then work with your dive rep. Again, your dive rep is probably going to be your number one supporter, um, especially with establishing boundaries with parents, especially with establishing boundaries with athletes, especially with, um, you know, if something is feels out of control or it's too much for you that's that's probably the first person you should reach out to whether it's getting back on emails or anything like that and uh even if it means like if you if you're trying to come up with a plan and you're having trouble coming up with a plan they can honestly help you like classroom management parents parents know a little bit about that so i assume your dive rep is probably a parent they usually are all right league and team management so understand the league mission. So we went over this a little bit, understanding what the rules are, but like the biggest thing is what's the mission? What's the point of MCDL? What's the point of diving in our community? You know what I mean? I think pretty much everybody that I'm looking at on screen was a diver in MCDL at one point or another. And if not, they've been a coach for a long, long time in MCDL. So what is the mission? Like what, what is the point of diving in our, you know, in MCDL um, and then, yeah. And then teach and model sportsmanship. That's big. I mean, that, that's a big part of the reason why we do sport, I believe. Um, and then disregard judges, stay focused. So that more or less gets into the competition aspect of it is um, there's gonna be a lot of distractions that take away from the mission and take away from what sport is about. And judging can sometimes be one of them. The, the parents are judging. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have, I mean, we're, we're due judge education, but um, you, you have to come down 
to like, why are the kids diving and are they feeling good about themselves and uh, staying focused on what you're supposed to be there doing for the kids doesn't, isn't necessarily arguing with judges or judge scores. It's mostly about making them feel happy with their performance. Um, if they're not happy, making them understand why they can do a better job and what they need to do a better job. Why we do it. This is a question I've asked myself so, so many times over the past 20 years. Why, why do I keep finding myself coming back to coaching? Like not even just diving, just sport in general. Um, but it teaches to overcome. Diving is, is sport is, that's really like it's a primal instinct to overcome um, challenges. With diving, we get the physical and we get the mental. There's so many challenges in diving. Um, the challenges that you'll teach kids to come over, to overcome in our sport, that type of behavior they'll bring into their life, hopefully, in other aspects, whether it's um, attacking the job market, um, building a relationship with someone, um, stuff like that. Diving can build confidence. Diving can diminish limiting beliefs. Um, you'll experience that a lot where you'll have a kid do something they didn't think that they were ever gonna be able to do. Um, there's nothing more empowering than that. Um, who gains the most from your attention and praise. This is very important. If you're trying to build an environment that is productive and pulls in the direction of uh, productivity, where you give attention and praise to will dictate that environment. Um, what I'm trying to say is Sally's upset about a dive. She's always upset about this dive and it's, what it does by me always going to Sally about her dive is she takes me away from the other athletes that are really just crushing it over and over again. You know what I mean? And maybe Sally's not doing that bad. Um, so does Sally deserve your attention? Probably um, during practice, maybe not, may not be the right place. You can be like, Hey, Sally, you can be upset. I want you to go over there, you know, chill for a little bit. Let me concentrate on this group and then talk to her after. Um, but you definitely want to give attention and praise to the people that are doing the things that you want to do and not necessarily give attention to the people that aren't doing that. That's advice from me as a sage coach, not that I'm that sage, but um, yeah, you know, that being said, anybody who's showing up on the pool deck deserves your attention. So just because they're not pulling in the direction that you want to be pulling the team in doesn't mean that you shouldn't be addressing them later. Um, there's definitely a right time and a, and a right place for it. Matt and Celia, you guys are going to learn that. Yeah, if you don't already. <laughs> All right, environment. Understanding, understand what kind, uh, what kids are to the parents. Um, kids are everything to their parents. You know, so, you know, um, I'm learning this right now. I just had a son, Hunter. Um, kids are everything to their parents. So um, they want to make sure that they get the best for their kids as much as possible, right? But you may be working with up to 40 kids with 40 different sets of parents, right? So you're, you're talking about 80 parents. Um, so everybody, every parent that you're gonna work with might have this scope. And a lot of them will also be open and understanding that like they're part of a team, right? With our sport, it's so individual based. Um, so it's it's really easy to forget that we're a part of a team, but you, but you are part of a team, okay? But when you're interacting with parents, it's super important to know that. So when parents are upset or they feel like their kid deserves something, they're right to feel that way. You know what I mean? But helping them understand maybe why it can't be that way or how you are doing what's best for their kid, um, you know, just understanding where their parents are coming from will be important because again, they are. And then again, if you're having trouble with this or communicating with parents, your dive rep is going to be your, um, your number one sidekick. Create a safe space. I have this in here multiple times. Um, because it's important, okay? We can go over what a, what a safe space is, but basically, if you think a kid, if you're unsure if a kid should do a dive that they're about to attempt, maybe they shouldn't. There's nothing wrong with going back and doing more rep, reps, right? Even if they are physically prepared, mentally, mental preparation is also part of it, right? It's not just physical preparation. Mental preparation is a big part of it. So creating a safe space, a lot of it is, um, you know, you'll see the most, most growth in an environment that has that. Um, make it positive, encouraging, and inclusive. You were on stage. So, yeah, I'm, so, I mean, 
that's the environment that I've seen the most growth out of when you're encouraging inclusive, everybody feels empowered. Everybody's success is on the shoulders of everybody that's on the team. Um, so, you know, everybody's invested. So when Matt's trying to get, you know, 307C and Celia is there like, you know, I think if you get a smaller tag, you probably probably get that 307C on three meter springboard, not 10 meter, but also 10 meter. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, you know, if you're encouraging each other and, and really like you're really rooting for your other teammates, if you can create that environment where everybody's sort of rooting on for each other or like, you know, Timmy does that finally gets that front one and a half off and he's been struggling with it for years and everybody was a part of helping Timmy get that front one and a half. If you can create that environment, um, it's going to be great. And then you're on stage is super important when you're coaching every single day. Um, everybody's watching you, you know what I mean? So it, make it positive, keep it positive, keep it safe because people are watching, parents are watching, um, the, you know, the reps are watching and then probably uh, the management company that's, that's running the pools watching as well. Um, be age appropriate and professional. This gets hard too, especially because a lot of you guys might be the same age as some of the people you're coaching or just a little bit above we as coaches want to befriend some of these people. We want to have that relationship, but really keeping the professional boundaries is the easiest way for you to make the decisions and do the things that is best for the individual and for the team. So, um, you know, we can probably have a whole hour presentation on that, but yeah, be professional, be age appropriate. Um, you can get a lot of that understanding from your rep, like what is appropriate, what is allowed at my pool. You know, each pool is different, even in that, you know what I mean? I worked at a summer league pool where we weren't allowed to have, have cell phones. Um, and the only way for me to get in contact with the membership was for me to email the management company and they forwarded my emails to the dive team. Um, so no, knowing, knowing that stuff is important, manage fear, build trust. We went over that a little bit already, but you know, mental preparedness is a big thing. And, it, and you'll see, those are nuts that you guys will be able to break. You'll see that, you know, if a kid is afraid, sometimes they'll crash just because of that fear. Sometimes the lack of faith will, will make them miss a dive. Um, and then that trust will diminish really, really quick. Um, so it's okay for you to maybe go back. Obviously, sometimes doing a big push because you know they're capable and doing a big push for a dive or something like that is totally appropriate. Um, but if you manage fear the right way, you'll build trust. And when kids trust you, they'll do, they'll do it for you. You know, those things, those big things that, that may be scary, but they know that you've had their safety and, and best interest at heart. So you'll start seeing those, those bigger moves for you as a coach, um, value progress, regardless of talent. Um, this, this, um, kind of goes back onto what we were talking about before with, like having a team that pulls in the same direction. If you're valuing progress, if you're valuing hard work, you're gonna have a, a team that works hard and progresses, okay? Um, the thing that will score more points at championships or at your dual meets is going to be not, it might be one person scoring a lot of points, but it could also be you know, a bunch of people scoring points. The other thing is, that sole diver that you may have that can score a lot of points is going to do it a lot better when there's a bunch of other people underneath pushing. And then, and those might flip flop, you know what I mean? When you're chasing somebody or, you're, or you guys are pushing and pulling in the same direction. Um, that's where you'll see people really do things they didn't think they were able to do. All right. How it all works. Part number two, you guys have any questions for that last, for that last part? Is there anything that you guys, can take your mic off and ask a question. Nope. All right. Um, the transaction. So this is just how it works between coach and athlete. Um, so basically your role is your coach. You have information to help them get better. And what the diver wants to do is get better. That's your relationship. You're, you're rarely going to meet a, a diver who doesn't want to get better. Um, you may have that perception for a diver, but everyone you meet is probably going to want to get better. Um, yeah. And then the exchange is info from the coach goes to the diver and then hopefully that results in change. So you could figure out how to get that information to a diver in a way that produces change, hopefully for the better and not for the worse. Uh, this transaction of information should be professional and healthy. 
Um, there's lots of different ways that you can give information. Um, we're going to go over them, but you can scream and yell at them. You know what I mean? There's the carrot and the stick analogy, or there's just, you know, you're just giving them information, helping them change. But, uh, you know, like I said before, divers, divers want to change. People that are doing a sport want to change. Everybody wants to change. Like if there's an opportunity for them to do better at something, they'll do better at it. Communication. There's lots of different ways to communicate the change that you want to see um, an athlete do. So examples of these are verbal, where I'm telling you what I want to see, point your toes, get your feet together. There's physical, where you can um, bring them over and have them do it. Take a seat on the ground next to me, show me your toes pointed and feet together, um, or you can grab their feet and point their toes. Obviously, the physical one, like being able to touch athletes and stuff like that, I know that we're opening up in Montgomery County in Maryland, but just make sure you know what your pool is comfortable with before you're hand spotting or, or touching these kids. They may want you to keep a six foot space at all times, um, or eight feet or 10 feet, who knows. Um, and then visual, you can do visual by you're showing them the action you want them to see. You might be showing them a video of something you want to see. You may be video them and are showing them a replay. You may have um, replay systems, right? Some dives, some divers need a reason or more information. So sometimes telling like, Hey, get your hands up. Hey, I told you to get your hands up. Hey, get your hands up. When do you want me to get my hands up in my hurdle or off the board? Or I, I don't, I don't even know when I'm supposed to be getting, and they may not ask that questions. Lots of things that you're going to teach these kids are things you didn't think you had to teach someone, right? Like standing in line, um, going head first through the water. There's going to be plenty of things that you're going to have to teach kids, even just when to listen. You know what I mean? Like my expectation is when people get on the board, their eyes should be on me, setting that expectation, teaching them that that's the expectation. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So getting your arms up, putting context to it, explaining, maybe just even giving a little bit more explanation. Like I want you to get your hips underneath your arms on your fronts. You know, but I feel like I somersault more when my shoulders are forward. You know, well, you do somersault more when your shoulders are forward, except we don't push the board down further. So we want to push the board down further before you get your shoulders over your toes. Like those explanations might help produce a change. You know what I mean? Um, presentation is a big one. Um, if you're sitting around and you're not engaged, then you're prob you can expect pretty much the same engagement from the athletes that you're working with. If you're standing up and you're moving around and you're engaged in what they're trying to do and you're excited about what they're trying to do, they're going to be excited about what they're trying to do. Does that make sense? So if you're sitting down, you're probably going to have a lot of people dragging their feet. You know what I mean? Not that you can't sit down and you guys might be coaching, you know, four or five hours on the pool deck in the sun. You know, I sit, you know, sometimes I lean on a chair, but if it's, if you can see the group you know, sort of dragging their feet or someone's dragging on a dive and it's a big dive. They need some energy, get up and move and, and be energetic. And, and they, people are responsive for what energy is put out there. Um, and then change it up. This is another big one. I mean, all, all four of these are big, but change it up. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results, Albert Einstein. So that's on the wall at KSAC, right? I walk past every time I go to the bathroom. Um, but it's a really good quote. I don't know how to admit this person when I'm Um, so yeah, I mean, changing, changing how you make a correction. I've, I've corrected a position off the board so many times, right. And then all of a sudden been like, Hey, I want your dive to land here in the water. And then got that correction off the board. And it was totally different, different place than when they were, when I wanted the correction to happen. I coached the entry and then I got a correction on the start. Right. Um, You've tried the verbal cue over and over again. That didn't work. So maybe you're trying a physical cue, right? Change it up. Don't, you know, one, it'll be frustrating for you. And two, it's going to be frustrating for the individual. You know what I realized that I don't have on here is when you do see a correction made, praise that correction. You know what I mean? It's really easy in diving. There's always something wrong. There's always something that you can tell them to do better. If they did the thing that you want, wanted them to do better, make sure you notice it, make sure you let them know, Hey, that that's exactly what I was looking for. That was better. 
um, if you go from correction to correction, if you're like, um, hey, James, keep your feet together on the next one. And they keep their feet together. I'm like, hey, James, I want your elbows locked out through the water. And then they go again and you're like, James, I want to see a better tuck. Um, you're, you're just going to be going around in circles. You're probably not going to get any of those corrections to stick. So if you can stay consistent with the correction, make sure if they do it, they know they did it and that you're happy with it and you praise them for doing it. You'll start seeing change happen more long-term. You'll see a lot of the same mistakes repeat if you're constantly giving different corrections. Um, verbal address one thing at a time. So that's pretty much what I just talked about. Addressing one thing at a time, um, keeping it simple. If I give, you can give, you could probably give three corrections in a dive. For a lot of people, that's going to be too hard. Um, but if you corrected the start, something in the middle and the bottom, that's probably doable for a, for a really elite competent diver. Um, but for most people, just focusing on one thing is going to be something they're going to be able to do, right? The other thing too is when you're focusing on one thing and while you're doing a complex moving movement, other things might get messed up. But if they did the thing that you wanted them to do, praise them, maybe try and have them be a little bit more turned off in the brain, but still paying attention to that um, correction and then do the full dive, right? Um, that's why doing dry land is so, you know, doing models on the side can really, really be your best friend because they can turn their brain off, still do the dives and you just drill the correction that they want, right? Shouldn't be so focused on a single correction that it messes everything else up. Maybe you do want that. All right. Describe the how, what, and when of the correction. So I went over this a little bit, but like the correction of getting your arm, get your arms up, you know, your arms get up on board work twice. If you're doing a full approach, they get up in the hurdle, they get up off the board. So make sure you have context of how, what, and when the correction is happening. Um, otherwise they might be confused. And I've worked with college athletes. I've worked with, you know, some, some of the smartest people, you know, I don't know, really brilliant people. And they still, people won't ask sometimes, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, sometimes it's up to you to, to make sure that the context is there. And if it seems like they're not getting it, you bring them over like, hey, do you know what I want? Um, that could help make that conversation as well. Um, use word pictures, creative analogies to help understand and make a connection to the athlete. So um, yeah, I mean, the more visual it is in their brain, the better it is. So like, I'll say, I want you to throw so hard, like you have spiders on your hands and you're trying to throw spiders off your hands. Like that visual and that action is such a fun, thing and you can really like sense like yeah i want to throw hard enough to get spiders off my hands that makes a lot of sense this is a correction that i use mostly in halloween but it trickles in every once in a while through the year um but it's fun you know what i mean and you can, and you build that connection with with the athletes there's another one that i like and it gives me a fun cue when i'm at meets is basically the timing that i want people to line up on backs is when if i was to pick up a table if I was to pick up a table that had plates on it, there's a point at which all the plates fall off. So my analogy is like, imagine that um, there's table settings on the Titanic in the dining room, right? And this big gigantic ship called the Titanic hits a glacier and it breaks and it's sinking and the back half of the ship tips up and the, and the tables are all drilled to the floor. They don't move. So when the ship tips up, all the plates slide off the table that's when I want your hands to move. It's like ridiculous explanation of when I want your hands to move off your body. But then I can say, I want to see you do back entry like the Titanic, which doesn't make any sense. The coaches around us sort of are like, now we can scream Titanic in the middle of the dive. So you can make those fun cues and fun connections with your divers, but it really helps paint a really, really good picture. Sometimes creativity is, is great. Physical, if you can't, if a diver can't do a skill on the dry land, let's say holding her like standing with their knee up or um, standing with their arms above their head or even getting in a handstand, if they can't do a skill on the ground, hold a hollow shape, right? Um, hold a plank. If they can't hold a skill on the dry land, the chances of them being able to do it while they're flying in the air or on the board while it's moving and adding force to their body is probably less, right? So make sure you're meeting the athletes where they are, right? If you're expecting a change that they can't do on solid ground with no force being administered to their body, the expectation of them to do it flying in the air or on a springy board, which that does put force in their body, um, you know, it's definitely a lot harder. 
So build up their tolerance on the dry land maybe, and then you know you might see more change on the diving board or flying through the air. So dry modeling, I'm like super, I love modeling. I'm very, very um, specific with how I want things modeled. The more specific you are, the better. Um, modeling can form good habits or bad habits, right? So what you're letting people practice is important. So that's the third part is manipulation. Be, be very careful with what habits you're developing. Um, if you're developing bad habits, then your divers may get worse. If you're developing good habits, then your divers are going to get better. Visual examples. So you can find examples online. Maybe you have videos of yourself doing skills. You can get up there and do a video. Um, FINA has a YouTube channel. There's a whole bunch of other, there's more and more dive channels that come up every day. I mean, nowadays, every 2023, 2022, 2021, 2020, um, high school graduate, they have the recruiting videos on there. You can find dives from people's recruiting videos. Um, but yeah, you, you can play a video. Um, or if you've gone to meets, especially if you've gone to high performance meets, you can, you know, video at those meets, save them, use them. Um, I've used so many dives that I've videoed from meets that I've at to be a visual example of what I'm trying to get somebody to do. Um, or you can use a replay system. Um, your pool may have a replay system. If they don't, there's apps you can get on an iPad or an iPhone. This is something you can talk to your rep about. Um, if it's expensive, you can maybe even get reimbursed for it. Um, video delay apps. Yeah. Motivation. Why do divers dive? These are the questions that, you know, you guys are going to have to figure out and it's going to be all individual based. Um, finding out why a diver dives will help you give them what they're looking for in the sport. I more than likely a lot of these divers in the summer league are doing it because it's social. They dive because they want to be a part of the, this, this group of people. Um, but some of them are trying to challenge themselves. Some of them are trying to do something that um, they feel makes um, gives them challenge and growth, you know, and they feel it mentally and physically. Um, so if, why do divers dive? It's going to be an individual question. You guys are going to have to figure that out with each diver. Um, why do they love what they do? Why do they hate what, you know, why do they hate some things? That's another thing, right? It's all individual based. Um, and if you can figure out that you're going to understand what motivates them. Um, and that's number three, understand their inherent, uh, motivation. So, if it is social, you know, you can let them get their social time in and then get them to be like, hey, you guys can go and do a couple free dives together and have a little fun. And then I want you to come back. We're going to do three front dive tucks. You know what I mean? If it is someone that wants to be pushed, um, then you're like, hey, you know, this is the correction that I'm looking for. If we can get this correction done, then I think we're about ready for that front double pike. You know, and you're putting that dive out there as somebody that's maybe motivated by degree of difficulty or something like that. If you can find out what motivates an individual, um, you're gonna you're you're gonna make them happy. You know what I mean? And you're gonna get them in the most productive state that you can. That also changes group dynamics, right? Do you want to have a practice where you're gonna have a bunch of social people goofing around and then have someone who's trying to get higher degrees of difficulty? So being able to group people will help too. If you have two boards, that's good. Or if you have different times, that's good too. Grouping by age usually. Um, mediates a lot of that. Um, guide them to additional motivations. Um, yeah, I mean, you can make things come from inside. You know, you can make kids be motivated, you know. So, like, if you've ever, and this is the reward effort, but Candy does a lot of work. I like to use Candy. Um, you know, if you guys dive with me on Halloween, I've gotten kids to do some, I've gotten kids to do back two and a half straight with candy, just for a Tootsie Roll, just for a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> um, but reward effort. Um, but if you imagine, this was the analogy I used last time, and it's sort of one that comes up, I think about it a lot. You guys have phones. There are games nowadays that are specifically made for your phone. You know, there's so many games that you can play on your phone, but they're, they're addictive. And if you think about how game, a developer creates a game. When you're a coach and you get a new athlete or even an athlete that's already been in the game for a little while, your job is exactly like that developer is to get them to learn how to play the game, to have fun with the game. Oh man, I got to go grab my charger, have fun with the game and like try and accelerate. Right. 
So, and then you're, you're moving challenges. So they're further spaced out. But when you first start playing a game on your phone, the first few levels are probably super easy and make you feel really, really good. You're like, yeah, I'm good at this game. I'm really, I'm kind of awesome at this game, you know? And then all of a sudden it's like a little bit harder. You worked a little bit harder for that next, you know, reward, you know? And in the beginning, maybe you're getting rewards all the time, especially on the phone. They're like, Hey, you, you played so well this first hour, you get, you know, another hour for free and you get all these, you know, additional things to help you play the game even better, you know? Um, and then it gets harder and then you get less help and then it's, you know, it gets a little bit more serious. Um, it gets more challenging, but the rewards might be bigger. You know what I mean? Or the rewards might be changed. They might change. Like you might end up with a kid who's motivated by can by candy or by doing certain things. And then they're just motivated. They did well in a meet and they're motivated by that second place. And now they want to get first place. You know what I mean? And then they're motivated by like, yeah, I got first place, but I heard, you know, I saw this kid on YouTube who's doing this dive. I want that. You know what I mean? Their, their motivation can change. It can evolve. Um, how you communicate to them and, and how you help them can dictate that. But I like to think of like when you're coaching kids, it's like a video game. Um, you know what I mean? So some techniques. I'm actually going to let you guys sit with that. I'm going to go grab my computer charger. I'll be right back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, all right, some techniques. So th this is like, we're gonna touch techniques just a little bit. This is basically where we would get in the water and I'd show you some stuff. Um, if you feel uncomfortable teaching something, my suggestion would be don't, you know, get comfortable with it and then teach it. Um, there's lots of resources out there. Uh, again, in this area, we have so many good coaches that you guys can reach out to. And then I'll, I'll be a resource if you guys want to reach out to me for anything. If there's something that make you feel uncomfortable or something is happening with the diver, you don't know how to fix it, you can reach out to me. But there's so many people that you can reach out to. There's so many resources, too. You can shoot. If you're a USA Diving member, sorry, Rand. Uh, if you're a USA Diving member, you can reach out to USA Diving and get information there. Um, so there's also a, there's a coach in New York, who's producing a, uh, like a level system and an education system. That's just going to be a phone app and it's going to have videos and skills and stuff like that. Skill progression. Um, so once that's available, that will be a good one, but till then use your community. Um, so the first thing we go over is like, where, where does flip come from? So these one, these are going to be questions for you guys to answer. So flip comes from, so this is a springboard. Flip comes from leverage and force being put into, into that leverage. So if, if my phone is forward, if, if I've leveraged past its point of contact and I add force to that, then it's gonna flip in this direction. That's where, that's where flip comes from. So leverage creates rotation. What affects the speed of spin? Anybody answer that one? There's basically like three things. It affects that speed of spin. So like the more I press the board down, the more force I get. So the more force I get could create more spin, assuming that I have leverage in the same place, right? The more I leverage, the more spin I get. So levers, so more leverage can either be a bigger lever creates more force, right? A heavier lever, a longer lever, or yeah. I mean, like this is this is less leverage forward than this, right? And then if it was bigger, like if I'm leveraging with my hands as opposed to my body, my body's going to be more forced than my arms, right? And then the last thing is the size of your shape. So a pike will spin slower than a tuck, right? And a straight position will spin slower than a pike, okay? A big tuck will spin slower than a small tuck, all right? So the smaller you are, the faster you spin. 
Um, there's lots of things that you can use as leverage, um, but some, you know, some things will, will dictate whether you're in control or not. Um, so hips, head leverage. I don't remember why I wrote it like that. I wrote it, created this last week and I remember exactly what I wanted, but your head is your control center. I know why I wrote down hips and head, but I don't remember why I wrote those three things together. But your head is basically what I can call your control center. So like if you watch NC2As or you watch some of these big meets and you'll see girls, specifically girls three meter springboard, you'll see them move their head a lot, especially on pikes. Um, and they leave her a lot with that. But then so often we hear like, oh, don't throw your head, you know, because you're, you're going to hip into the board and you're on the board, right? Um, I think the biggest thing to understand about that is your head is your control center. If you're moving your head around, this is where your senses live. If your senses are moving around a lot, you may not be able to sense what's going on with the rest of your body. So that's really the big thing. At an elite level for gainer two and a half pike, the girls that are doing that dive, they can move their head and still feel where their hips are going. Okay, so hips essentially is where you end up going. So if you move your hips away from the board, you'll go away from the board. Does that make sense? So you still wanna move your hips up, right? Cause we want dives to go up. But if your hips move away from the board, you'll move away from the board. We don't necessarily wanna throw our hips out all the time. You won't spin maybe, you won't go high. But if I move my head a bunch, I don't know if you guys can see this. If I, if I move my head a bunch, me sensing if my hips are going up and out or just up, gets, you know, um, isn't clear, you know, in my, you know, and visually you can sense where you are visually, you can sense where you are if you're upside down and right side up. So this is moving a lot while you're at the end of the board, you sensing where your hips are going is obscured. Okay. Inwards are a big one. If I'm moving back and forth, how can I feel if my hips are moving up and out? You know what I mean? If I'm keeping my head still, I'm moving my hips under and away, my head's staying still, you can feel if that dive is moving safe or not, you know? And then there's arm timing, all that other stuff. But if you're paying attention to those things, three things, if you're creating leverage, the head's staying in control and the hips are moving away from the board, you should have some safe dives. Can we go into that a lot more? Sure we can, but I think that's it for this, for what we're learning right here, right now. Um, that's good enough. How do you go faster? We kind of went over that, effects of speed. Uh, front and back flipping compared to inward and reverse flipping. So the difference between front and back is front and back, the direction that we're going away from the board. Hey guys, Bruce, the direction that we're going away from the board is also the direction that we're creating leverage, right? When it comes to inwards and reverses, the direction that we're creating rotation, we're creating leverage, and the way we're moving away from the board is in the opposite direction, right? So that's the difference between front, back, reverse, and inward. So, and then you can see in my hand, if this was inward or reverse, I'm leveraging past my point of contact to create somersault, but then moving my hips up and out, whether it's reverse or inward, that shape could be somewhat the same, right? So yeah, understanding how those work. You wanna create leverage while the board is coming up, right? So if you're doing um, front and inward, we're gonna get on the, over this later, but when the board is down, you wanna be creating that leverage as the board's coming up so that you can send your hips away. I don't know, we'll go over that more a little bit. What does your arm swing do? Can you guys answer that one? Again, there's t-shirts. You guys are gonna get free t-shirts if you answer questions. What does the circle on the end of the board do? What does the arm swing and the hurdle do? So if you imagine, if you imagine a windmill, right? And it spins like this, and then it has this wide base. Why does a windmill have a wide base like this? When the windmill swings around, the blades pull in the direction that they're swinging. But also like as they swing up, it creates force down because there's opposite and equal reaction. But um, the arm swing moves the board down. That's the point of the arm swing. So the arm swing moves the board down. The swing to the heart, it can also lighten us. So as it comes up, it also can lighten us. So the arm swing moves the board. Um, what about before the hurdle? I forget why I wrote that one too. It's so funny. I wrote this like really quick. 
last time and it was so in context and now I'm like, I'm trying to remember what I wrote down. Um, what about before the hurdle? I mean, it's supposed to push the board down. Arm swing timing, front, back, verse, um, inward and reverse. Can you guys help me with that one? What's the difference between arm swing timing on front and back and inward and reverse? So I, talk, I hit it on the last slide a little bit, but basically you wanna be creating leverage when the board is recoiling. So if the arm swing is, to, is supposed to load the board, so if the arm swing brings the board down and then your throw needs to happen while the board is coming up, what's the difference between front back or front? What's the difference? I'll answer between? that one. Yeah, hit me, man. So, okay, so for like front and inwards, your arm circle and like everything has to happen a lot quicker. You can take yep. your arms back up and then for gainers and um, backs, they have to happen a lot later. You have to wait. Yeah, why is that? Um, I know um, for front, because like you want to have your arms up to be able to throw. Yeah, because you're changing directions. Like back, right. back in reverse, you can be caught behind because you're going, that's the direction that you're going, the same direction. Yeah. As you're going. Front and inward, you have to change directions. But yeah. I'll, do, I'll do a quick little visual, but... I'm circling and the board is going down and then I need to change directions as the board recoils, right? Front and inwards. On backs, the board is going down and then the board recoils, I can continue my throw. But if you watch like, uh, um, if you watch, I'm trying to think, Brie Adam from Miami or, um, oh my God, what's his name from Texas? Uh, Jordan Wendell. Um, their arm timing is exactly the same because they're so good at riding the board that it's exactly the same. They load the board down, the board is down, and then they change direction for fronts. They, they, sorry, they unload, load the board, the board is down, and then they stand up and do backs, right? But knowing that like the reason why we do different timing, but then you have Michael, Michael Hickson, he does very different timing for both those sides, right? And he's an Olympian, he's a medalist. Um, but yes, because for fronts and inwards, Matt had it right, spot on, um, our arms need to be ready sooner because they need to be changing directions to create leverage in a different direction. Learning how to stop or slow rotation. You don't really stop rotation. You know, I guess the water kind of stops you, but we don't really stop rotation. So we slow rotation. So the way we slow rotation is we, when we're spinning, we said it earlier, smaller shapes spin faster than larger shapes. So coming out will slow you down, right? This is why we do a pike out because we want a precision en entry. So if you're doing front two and a half, tuck on one meter, you might be going really fast in the tuck and then you pike out, slow it down a little bit, see where you want to go. Then you move your feet out, it slows it down even more. And then right before you hit the water, you close your hands and it slows it down even more. Yeah. And then you hit the resistance of the water and you travel through the water. Um, the order of operations is important, follow the kinetic change. Um, so on the start, you go, you're going to throw and move into a tuck from the or pike from the top to the bottom. And then when you come out, you're going to go lower body to upper body, right? Legs, hips, hands. All right. On the way out. That, that chain is important, especially if you want to have precision entries. All right. If you line up with your hands before you've kicked out, you're probably gonna miss what you lined up on. If you slow it down a lot with your legs and then put your hands on the water, the chances of you putting your hands on the water where you want them are a lot higher. Um, path of, of least reaction, lining up lateral versus midline. Um, the closer you are to your center line, so like the side of your body, the less reaction you're gonna have. If I move my hands out away from my body, it will drop my feet. I don't know if, if you guys have ever done this, but have you ever, have you ever done back dive and you feel yourself going way over and you put your hands out and it sort of saves the dive? Like it sort of sort of works that way. Now you don't necessarily want to do that because it's ugly, but, um, but yeah, how you move your hands and what kind of reaction you want. If we're doing back one and a half tuck, you, you want to kick, leave your feet, look back, and you really probably don't want that much reaction. So you're going to slide close to your body, right? You don't really want. So important of close and sequence. So the sequence matters. We went over the sequence before a little bit, but um, yeah, midline is going down the, down the center. I have a technique that I like. You guys can play with it. I like elbows first, elbows and hands. Um, and then lateral would be coming up the sides. Ripping the entry. 
So you go through, if you guys are doing a judging clinic, you'll see that there's five things that are judged. Entry is one of those five things. So two points should only be allocated to a dive for the entry. But if you've ever been in a dive meet, you know that's not true. Two points aren't allocated to, to, to the entry. Lots of points are allocated to the entry, right? Um, so this is, you know, knowing the game and understand that like being able to go through the water clean and rip a dive, it's important. You know what I mean? Is it the end all be all everything? No, you guys should really teach kids how to be safe. But going through the water is also something that you want to be able to teach well and that will help them stay safe. Um, so yes, it's the highest valued element of the dive, but also it's probably the place where they can also injure themselves the most. Um, so hand position, I go grab across the knuckles, flat hand on the water. Head position is between your ar arms, eyes up, going through the water, the head shouldn't really move. Um, body shape should be in a hollow, strong shape that's going in the direction that you're traveling, right? So if it's a back dive, it's in this shape. If it's a front, it's in this shape. You guys get what I'm saying? If it's a reverse, it's in this shape. And if it's an inward, it's probably in this shape. You guys get what I'm saying? And then swim and save. The swim and save isn't that important with a lot of the kids that you're going to be working with. Saving, like Somerset, unless you're in a you know an eight foot deep pool, maybe it is important because you guys are going to hit the bottom of the pool. Um, but what's really the most important thing that you're going to teach a lot of these young divers or or initial divers is just making sure they go through the water tight and straight, um, and following the the path of least resistance, right? So when we swim and save, we, we should be swimming to, our, to the sides of our body following our scapular plane. So our scapular plane is like, you know, your scaps, those wing, those blades in the back of your shoulders. You should basically just be following those. If I'm in a hollow front, my scapular plane is a little bit there. So my hands will follow that path. If I'm doing a back entry, my, you know, it's a little bit back, but just moving your hands down the side pretty much follows the scapular plane. If your head moves when you go through the water, then your body will move in a different direction and then your arms are swimming. And then your arms will no longer move with your scapular plane. So that's why I was saying earlier, really just being able to hold that shape through the water, no head movement, no body shape movement is number one. And then the swim and save is number two. But save, I don't know if you guys don't know, it's basically a somersault underwater. So they, they call it a save because you save your back, but really, you can save the entry. There's a lot of things that you can save. Making the save, tight through the surface is its first, is the number one thing. Um, for like super beginner divers, get, have them go deep first. You know, if they're learning an early save or they start ducking their head, you're gonna teach them a habit that could be dangerous later. So let them make sure they can keep their shape through the surface, maybe even deeper than the surface. All right, pike save for fronts. Everybody knows that, fronts and inwards. And then knee save for backs and reverses. That's where you like, you, again, you're just following, you're following the path of the least resistance. So you're going in that way. But for, for a back and reverse, it would be like, you're getting that position, like you're skydiving. And then you, and then you basically bring your knees down or you bring your heels to your butt is a, is a knee safe from backs and reverses. Um, splash comes from air that you bring underwater. So when you bring air underwater, if I'm moving my hands like this, I'm dispersing air. When I save, I'm dispersing air underwater, um, you know, when I, and then if I'm bringing my body through the water quicker, um, it also disperses air underwater. So there's less chance that it returns up in a splash. That's technical talk. I want to focus more on safety, but you know, if you want to make no splash, the air that you bring on the water, hopefully you want to bring the least amount of air as possible and the air that you do bring under there, disperse it as much as possible. That's why I like, if you see 10 meter, you can see people hit the water not save, just go straight through the water. They're going so fast, they're dispersing on the way they go down. You see like no splash sometimes and they're doing no technique to create no splash. Where does twist come from? This one's complicated, we can go over it more, but basically um, twist comes from flip. You take flip away from twist. That gets confusing because everybody knows you're like, oh, well I have that kid that's doing front flip full twist and they keep going on their face, right? So if you're coming off the board and you're, and you're dropping your hand and starting the twist while you still have contact with the board, if you're creating more leverage, you might be creating more flip. Does that make sense? If, you're, if you throw flip and then as you come off the board, you're pulling back and taking away from flip and doing twist, 
um, then it would take away from somersault. So the timing of when the twist happens can add or subtract somersaults, like a full out, for instance. If you guys don't know what a full out is, a full out is front two and a half somersaults with a twist after front double pike. Are you going to turn off that alarm? That's okay. Um, so when that part happens, you're taking away from the somersault to make the twist. And when you're doing, let's say, back one and a half, two and a half twists, you might be adding somersaults because of how early you're dropping that arm and going into the twist. You might actually be making, if you're still touching the board when you're dropping that arm, you might actually be making more somersaults because you're leveraging more. I don't know if that helps, but that's um, just something. But making twist is basically dropping something off access. It's also, yeah. So if you drop something off access and bring it up off access, you'll create twist. Um, I have, you know, you're dropping off the sides, but I'll, I'll, I have people drop slightly in front and come up slightly behind, but they're dropping off axis and coming back up off axis and create somersault. Um, swivel hips works in front twists. I, I try and make sure that they're starting to twist with their hips. So they're adding, with, starting twist with their hips and then getting their arm up off axis and adding twist. Um, so twist should be super tight. So if you want a faster twist, you can think of it as like this. If I had a dowel or if I had towel, a dowel, if I spin it, it spins a lot easier and faster than a towel. So if something is tight and strong, it's gonna spin faster than if it's um, soft, right? The other thing too is bigger shapes spin slower than faster shapes. So if I have a shape that's hollow, that's trying to twist as opposed to a shape, shape that's straight. This is going to twist a lot faster than this shape that's going to twist a lot slower. Okay. So that's how you make faster twists. Not to imagine if your head's down, you're probably going to get lost in the twist. The twist timing, the sequence of the twist needs to match up with the end of the flip. Lots of times when you see people square early or they lose their feet at the end of the dive is probably because the end of the twist isn't matching with the end of the flip. Does that make sense? So you, you intuitively know when you're going to land on your feet. If you've been flipping for a long time, you know where the end of the flip is coming because your, your head is in with the flip and you can sense it. But if I'm finishing my flip, if I'm like here finishing my twist and I'm still in out of the twist, I'm probably going to square early. And that's where you'll see those feet, lose those feet. You might see people get lost. So the, the twist needs to end either at the end of the flip or a little bit before the end of the flip. Okay, if you're expecting to dive it in, it should probably end a little bit before the end of the, of the twist. All right. Um, I mean, it gets more complex than that, but like, um, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. And then where you start it. So everything I like to say, it needs to start and end in this pocket. That's basically above horizontal, above your head. So if you're ending a twist here, it's probably too late. It might be okay. It depends on the dive. And if you're starting a twist here, it's probably too early. So you want to start and end the twist somewhere in this pocket that's above your head. So if you're doing front flip, you're getting your feet up, you're starting the twist, and then you're finishing the twist here and piking down the feet or piking down the head. Make sense? If you want to do more twists, then you can either twist faster or start your twist earlier in the sequence of the flip. So going from double out, we discussed double out or a full out, which was a full twist out of a front double pike into a dive. So you do front double pike, snap out, do a full twist, and then you add a dive. That front double pike, you snap out early, basically upside down or maybe a little bit past and do a full twist. If you wanna do double out, you're probably coming up before 12 o'clock. If you're doing triple out, you're probably getting in that pike and coming out right away, almost behind you, okay? Which is also how you do triple twisting front one and a half on three meter, or we had the kid rolling that did a triple twist in front one and a half on one meter this weekend, that was crazy. Um, but yeah, you're, you're getting the twist started earlier in the sequence of the flip, so it can end at the end of the flip. So that's the sequence, faster twisting, making twists. Does anybody have any questions with that? Cool. Every dive is a puzzle. Every, how many, um, every dive is a puzzle. Meet each athlete where they are. Um, again, like I, that's a lesson that I learned from my wife, Allie. Um, but 
it's important to have expectations that meet where the athlete is. Like if you're setting expectations for an athlete that are way too high, they may lose interest. If you're, if you're getting expectations for an athlete that are way too low, then they also might lose interest, right? Um, empower the athlete to make change. That's easier said than done, but when they make the change, make sure that you, you know, you, you see it, make sure they know that you've seen it. That's the easiest way to empower the athlete to make change. Um, make it come from the athlete. What I just said will hopefully help with that as well. Um, but making, making them feel good about what they're doing, making them feel like a champion, making them feel like a bad A will help it come from them. You know what I mean? And then keep it safe, build trust. Just reiterating that for the uh, fifth time there. Part three, what a discussion. So this is just like, you know, we're going to go over some, some wet skills and then just starting stuff, but start simple. Like if you, if this is your first time or this is your first time with this crew, keep it simple, keep it simple and start going from there. If you bite off more than you can chew, it's probably a bad idea. If you don't know these kids and you make five stations and you're the only coach and you have kids spread out on five stations and you don't know them at all, it's probably a bad idea. If I have a group of kids that I've been working with for 10 years and I spread them out at five station, I'm like, here's the workout. This is what I expect. This is what I want in this skill, this skill, and this skill go. Um, you know, it's different than if you don't know them. Have a written plan. If you guys aren't planners, that's okay. Some people can have a written plan up here, but it's really important to have a plan going into something. Okay. Trying to wing it by the seat of your pants, you know, it is going to just make it a lot more possible that somebody's going to get injured. If you can come in with a plan, you're lowering risk so much. Okay. You don't need that much time to write a plan. I've spent three hours writing a plan. I've also for the day and I've spent five minutes writing a plan for the day. Okay. So if you've never written a plan for before, you know, showing up to work early and coming up with a plan sometimes help, but allocate some time to come up with a plan and keep it minimal at first, and you'll get better at it as you go. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Um, make it more efficient. Every time you're done, sort of review what worked, what didn't work, and then try and build on what did work and maybe change what didn't. Um, a sequence is just a, an example um, or a preferred way to go uh, sequence of practice, but do stuff dry, then do it wet, go from simple and then to complex, right? There is utility from going complex to simple. Some of the divers that I'm working with this week because they have regionals are doing the opposite of complex of simple to complex. We're going complex to simple. Um, and the reason for that is for performance. We'll do a complex skill that requires a lot of force. And then I'll have them like back two and a half on three meter. And then they got to do a double bouncing reverse dive pike on three meter. Why? Because it, they have to turn off their brain. They have to forget what they just did. They have to be in the moment, right? So, but... This summer, when you're working with people, try to wet, have them show you it on the dry land, then in the water, have them do something simple before they do something complex, right? That's just called progressions. Do, do something in a progressive way. Um, having trouble, break it down. Um, break it back down to parts and drills. If they're, doing some, if they're doing a skill that's too advanced for them and they're building a bad habit, be, pay attention to the habits you're trying to build. You know what I mean? It's okay for them to go back to an easier skill and then go back to that big skill. Although some people are going to want to work, some people need to work on that bigger skill, right? So, you know, if, if that is the reason why they're there, sometimes you want to make sure that you're still giving them the thing that they need to show up every day. Um, that's part of it too. But yeah, build good habits, not bad habits. Keep it safe too. Order of operations. Again, this is a suggestion. I've definitely done things not in this order before. Um, but you're going to go from jumps to lineups, dives to flips, and then twists. So hopefully they're competent at jumping before they try any dives. Hopefully they're competent at going through the water falling before they do it with a jump, right? And then if they're doing a jumping dive, then they're doing a dive. Um, you should learn top dives before you learn flips. Like they should be good. It's hard to backtrack from flips. Um, plus if you learn a backflip before you learn a back dive, you're, you're risking injury. You know, I've seen a lot of people get hurt chucking backflips before they learn how to do a controlled back dive. And then they should hopefully learn how to do a flip before they learn how to do a twist since there is twisting in flips. But every once in a while, I see those back dive or front dive half twists happen before they learn how to flip. 
Um, front dive tuck before inward dive tuck. That makes sense. Back dive tuck, or sorry, front dive tuck before inward dive tuck. Yeah, that makes sense. Back dive tuck before reverse dive tuck. If you don't know your numbers, that's what these numbers are. Um, reverse dive tuck before backflip tuck. That's just a suggestion. Now I've, I haven't stuck to that faithfully. So I've done different cases. I've taught backflip tucks before reverse dive tuck, but if you can teach a reverse dive tuck before a backflip tuck, that's my suggested um, order of operations. Hurdle breakdown, this is just one for you. I have so many hurdle breakdowns, but H jump standing on the end of the board with your hands up and then H jump with an arm circle. So standing on the end of the board, circle, jump off and then do a jump. So they're adding a bounce, jump, circle, jump off and then um, swing arms are down, they swing up into a jump and then circle jump off. Then you start with your start in knee up, you know, jump, jump off. Then one step hurdle, jump, jump off, no arm circle. And then same thing with the circle, which is essentially one step hurdle at the end of that process. And then you do a two step hurdle and then a four step hurdle. Um, some people do one step hurdle and then a three step hurdle, you know, same, same thing. I like one step hurdle, two step, four step, because then it gets them to four step. It's hard to go from one step to four step, but one step to three step, you're starting with the same leg. So that's why I do the two step step. Anyways, so that's just a breakdown, hurdle breakdown if you guys want to teach a hurdle. But again, like doing these drills on the side before you do them on the water is going to up your success rate. Um, you're going to have kids that don't know how to go head first through the water, right? So you might have to teach them how to do it how to do a front dive. Ideally, you get them to a front dive tuck. If a kid is competent in a front dive tuck, they're going to be competent in a lot of different skills down the line. Um, but we've had kids before that can't go upside down, you know, in which cases, like, I don't know if you can hold them upside down in a handstand, but even just getting them up in a handstand or even in a plank will help them get upside down more. Um, you can do slides. If you have a mat, you can slide them off the side of the pool going through the water. You can even do a streamline where they have one hand on the wall, one hand in the water, and then they put their hands together, push and streamline, try and get their head between their arms. You can take a streamline, streamline through the water, and then take it and have it go down. Um, anything to help them get used to going upside down through the water. These are the things that you're potentially going to have to teach kids. Like They're not going to come in maybe knowing how to dive. Um, assisted front lineup 001b is a front lineup you can do it off the side you can do it kneeling so they're kneeling one knee down one knee up um, eventually progress to from their feet i spot their knees i make sure their back is flat their heads and their arms i spot their knees as they fall and then the knees are controlled if you try and spot their feet if they bend their knees you don't have any control so i'll spot their knees um, take it to the board they can do a rainbow dive so just a pushing hollow dive also known as a front pop off um, you can do it off the side of the pool you can do it off the diving board and then you slowly progress to a front dive tuck. So I'll do a rainbow dive with a slight knee bend and then I'll do a rainbow dive with a big knee bend and then I'll alternate it with a front jump tuck and then basically that front jump tuck turns into a front dive tuck. I love teaching hand spotting. So I'll hand spot front jump tucks and then I'll hand spot a front dive tuck. If you're comfortable with something like that, that's really, really quick, easy way to, to get a kid to front dive tuck. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with, with hand spotting, I suggest you don't do it. It does get pretty technical. There's little cues like having your foot next to them on the wall. If you're standing behind them on the wall, you may have them go right on the wall um, if you're not standing in the right spot. So definitely if you if you know how to hand spot, I say go for it. If you don't, there's, you know, you can reach out and learn. Um, but front dive tucks are good. So there's some just suggested progressions for that. But yeah, you may have to teach kids how to go upside down. You may have to teach kids how to just slide through the water. You may have to teach kids how to breathe out when they're underwater. So back dive, pretty much the same progression. You can do slide ins if you have a mat on the side. You can do back streamlines where they push off the wall and they're just practicing gliding through the water. You can have them practice gliding through the water and then go underwater backwards and try and take it as deep as they can. You could do falling back dives, assisted back lineups off a ladder if there's a ladder. You can do it off the side of the pool with falling lineups off the side of the pool. Just be aware, we dive in circular motions. There's, half, there's a wall halfway through to make sure they're not hitting their face on the wall. Um, I tell people, watch out for the wall or like, we're going to do this carefully and still get kids to hit their face on the wall. Um, so you're trying to do your best to not to mitigate those. But back lineup on the diving board is safer than the side of the pool. It's less scary. There's less chance of them smacking hard on the side of the pool, but it's, it, there's, there's less risk in the fact that they're not going to hit the wall. Um, 
if they go under the board, they go under the board. There's water there. You know what I mean? They might just may smack. So when spotting a back lineup, I'll grab their hands and I'll put my hand uh, like on their shoulder blades and then I'll guide their hands back towards the water, have their eyes follow, keep their eyes following, and then I'll move this hand down to their knees and slowly just put them in the water. That's how I hand spot a back lineup. Um, and then eventually I just go with the hand on the back and then eventually I just go from the hand up here and then eventually just stand there and then I go to the back of the board and I go to the side of the board and then, you know, and then you're not there anymore. Um, arms up, back dive straight. So it's like a pop off, but you have your hands up. I have them just, just like a rainbow dive, they can jump and look back. And then eventually I have them see their toes come up. And then eventually I have them see their knees and then straighten their knees. And then I'll have them do back jump tucks and then slowly progress to a back dive tuck, right? If they can hop off the board and see their toes come up and then look back for the water, they could probably do a back dive tuck. If they can do that, then they can see their knees bend and straighten them before they look back. If they can do that, then they can jump up grab their knees, kick at a spot and then look back and dive, right? But take your time, you know what I mean? If they're doing something where they're smacking over and over again, don't be afraid to go back a step or two. Inward dive, they should know how to do a front dive tuck. If they're doing inward dive, they should be able to do it standing, double bouncing, one step, full approach. Um, you can do the, you can do progressions with training mats or wet mats. Training mats would be like, if you have a panel mat to a crash mat, you can do a back jump to a doggy. You do the same thing into the water. Just make sure that they're jumping far enough away that they're not going to hit their chin or anything like that. Um, but that's a great drill. And then uh, progression off the board would be back jump, back jump straight with their arms up. They should be moving their hips back and their feet back. They might be going through the water a little bit tipped. You can do a tuck. I don't. I have been lately skipping back jump tuck. I've been doing back jump straight and then right to inward dive. Um, because for whatever reason, back jump tuck helps them bring their legs up in front. And I don't like that. I want them to have their hips back, toes back, and then go down to their knees. So it's more like the doggy action than a back jump tuck. And then uh, where the trouble starts, I forget where that one is, but um, be encouraging. You know, they go where their hips go. Their control center is their head. They move their hands in front, they're protected. This creates leverage. Reverse dive, you can do, they should know how to do a back dive tuck. Bum drops off the side. Again, that's just what you want to make sure that you're being careful to jump far enough away. When they fold, they should fold bum first. They shouldn't be landing on their back. That's probably too much rotation. Um, you can do it training match. You can do front jump, reverse jump, tuck, land it. Reverse jump, tuck to C drop. Reverse jump, tuck to back drop. Um, all from a TY circle. Um, you can do it from a double bounce or a one step. You can do it um, standing, do it from full approach, but that's the order. Basically I'll do it. Lots of kids. I'll have them do it standing and then double bouncing or one step hurdle and then full approach, um, where the trouble starts. Where the trouble starts is if they, if they're moving their eyes or their head too much, if they're moving their head too much. They don't know where their hips are, right? The head's not necessarily going to take them over the board. It's if their head's moving so much that they don't know where their hips are going. Okay. Front flip, they should be able to do a front dive tuck first. You can have them do, if they know how to do a roll on a mat, they should be able to do a roll on the air. So if they can't do a roll on the mat, then you're probably gonna have them, they're probably gonna have trouble doing a roll in the air for front flip, right? So they can do a roll on the ground. They can also do a roll, if you put a mat at the end of the board, they can do a roll so their bum is off of the mat when they finish the roll and then they just stand up on the water. You can do it off the side of the pool, you can do it off the diving board. Um, if you are going to feet, the more bum that's off the mat, that will help them get the feet. The more bum that's on will tip them to a front dive or to a belly flop. So just things to consider if you do it off of the pool or off of the diving board. And then side of the pool flip sequence, I'll go from eggy, I'll have them be in an eggy, and then I'll have them be in an eggy with their butt up. And then I'll have them have their hands up. And then basically they're just slowly progressing to a falling and then adding a jump. So they'll do an eggy, roll into the water, um, bum up, fall and then kick their butt and then hands up, fall, grab their shins, kick their butt. And then they add a little push or they stand up a little bit taller. Um, front flips, another thing that I love the hand spot that helps a lot. Essentially what you're looking for when they're doing eggies or when they're doing a falling flip is that you wanna see them connect to their flip and finish the full rotation. Their head should come all the way back up. They shouldn't really be trying it in the air if their head's not coming all the way back up. Um, and then on the board, you can do it hopping or standing um, hop with a circle and one step hurdle then full approach. That's the suggested progression for that. 
front flip full twist. They should learn a front flip tuck, a front flip pike. I do front flip free. I changed to 102 D. I call front flip free because even in the straight position, there's usually a little bit of pike. You can fall a little bit and keep it really straight. Um, they should learn how to turn or twist on the ground. I like them to learn how to twist on the ground first, whether it's just bringing their arm up and doing a half twist, bringing both arms up, doing a half twist, or bringing their arms up into a wrap and doing a full twist, either way. Um, and then half to full. I, I try and teach full twist right away for fronts, but I've gotten a lot of success out of teaching a half twist before a full or going half, three quarters, and then full. Um, so you can do it case by case. But yep. Again, the things that matter is coming, um, dropping your arm off axis and then coming back up off axis, and then they should be straight. Um, the best front flip full twists I've had happen is when kids throw, snap out of a twist, bring both hands up and do a full twist before learning how to wrap. Um, and really just straighter and tighter. Straight, tight, makes a twist. And that is it. Any questions? Or requests. Yep, it's half that side of the scene. Plus, don't they know we have gear still? They do know. I know. Matt got a shirt. He won a shirt. I don't know if anybody else answered any questions. Did anybody else answer questions? Just Matt. Uh, yes, another coach. Uh, she put it in the chat, not uh, not directly. Um, she didn't speak up, but uh, in the text she did. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Oh, Celia. No questions. Will we be getting the recording? like um will that be sent to us we'll definitely make that available and um either it'll go right to the reps because we don't have your email addresses right now um or it will be on the or and or mcdl's website so mc diving um uh, dot org perfect thank you certainly thank you Can that I was get... a great question yeah that was a good question and then David has my email. So if you guys need to reach out to me, you can reach out to me if you need anything. But again, there's lots of good coaches out here. Like I see a lot of, a lot of people from Merrimack. You guys have a stellar coach there. Kathy is awesome. So there's definitely a community of coaches out there that you can reach out to as well. Wes, thank you so much. And um, you know we'll come back with more questions as time comes on. Yeah, and that was um, that was Danielle, I think, that talked before. From Bannockburn. Yeah. Thank you, Danielle. Thank we'll you. get you some uh, West designed MCDL gear. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Should be like West designs. Well, I have so I started monumental diving, which I'm gonna I'm just gonna have t-shirts be produced from that i mean we did a club for the summer and i'll probably continue with the club it's in some level but um the concept between monumental will be like i want to create like no there's no like fun coffee table books about diving or the history of diving like what why doesn't that exist so i want to create stuff like that i think it'll be fun are you That's also awesome. a designer yeah yeah i went to school for graphic design i worked in design for um, for five years before I then was like, now nah, I'm, I'm a dive coach and then I still do it, but I, um, do, I'm a full-time dive coach now. Cool. I'm, I'm finishing graphic design. Ah, really cool. Yeah. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. So I'll hand you, you can take over the, all the MCDL stuff, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We can, I'll, so now we've got some. I'll do uh, a soft. I'll do a soft handoff. Yeah, you guys. Good. Thanks for all the EPS files. I definitely can have. I definitely could have some help, Danielle. If you want, if you want to help, I'd love to have it. Yeah, let me know. 
Well, thank you, Wes, so much. Thank you, coaches. The season does not exist without you. So this is fantastic. We'll uh, end the recording and uh, make this available hopefully within the next week. No problem, guys. See everybody. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Thank you, Wes.